Well, good morning, everyone. Um, we're going to continue our study on the book of Judges. And uh, before we begin, can we have a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are so very grateful uh, for all that you are doing in our lives, so that we can spend this time every day to study your word. We are thankful, Lord, for the instruction that you give us, the way your Holy Spirit speaks to us. And we are thankful for the strength that you've given us in mind and body to be able to contemplate these things and also to share them with others. We ask, Lord, that as we open your word together, your Holy Spirit can continue to guide and lead us and correct us. We pray for those who are studying and searching for truth, that you can lead them into all truth. Be with us now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning again, everyone. Now, um, in continuing the study of Gideon, we, we have still a few things left to look at. Now, one of the things that we had addressed uh, we spent quite a bit of time looking at the 300 and what this symbol means. And, um, and then we start looking at, started looking at um, these uh, passages with the trumpet and the pitcher and the lamp and what these symbolize. Now, the one thing that we, we clarified is that when we take this story and we make an application to our movement, we are zooming into a waymark on a line above us. And we still haven't completely defined all of these lines um, <clears throat> and which waymark of what line it is that we're zoomed into. But one thing we know is that we are not in the time of the actual Sunday law per se. Our movement is a zoom into the Sunday law. So in a sense, we're in the time of the Sunday law. But based upon the line that we've been looking at with this 300, dealing with uh, the message of Gideon representing the message of July 18, 2020, um, we're still before the midnight way mark on the line that starts in 1989, right? That line, which is 1989 is the time of the end, and 9-11 as Revelation 18, um, the Sunday law as the actual Sunday law in the United States is a zoom into the Sunday law waymark that Ellen White speaks of. So we would know that this story of Gideon is a zoom into a waymark that precedes the waymark of midnight. And I had drawn it on the board where we took... Um, uh, 11, 9 and, and July 18th, so November 9th, 1989 and July 18th, 2020, as symbols that lead us to um, uh, to our history. So there's we're zooming in on something that's before midnight. Now it could be that we're zoomed into the midnight way mark. That is, that's where this movement is is heading. Um but we might be actually zooming into a waymark that's on a line that is actually the zoom into the, to the midnight waymark. So where exactly we're zoomed into, that we don't know. What we do know is our line is typical. And we've been looking at a lot of these symbols. So one of the symbols of Gideon, when we had the 300 men, they're divided into three camps. And this number three leads us to the story of Ezra. So we, we attach this number three, the three days, which we symbolize in our 777 structure in a number of ways. One is there's the three specific Sabbaths, November 9th, 2019, uh, July 18, 2020, and December 25th, 2021. All three of those are Sabbaths. Uh, Adilio had noticed that in a period of 777 days like that, to have all of those dates line up with July 18th being the 26th day of the fourth month 
has only occurred once in history. That is, we can't go back and find any other um, times in history where all of those conditions are met. So it, it becomes a unique pattern, having all three of them falling on Sabbaths. Um, uh, the the symbols there. So July 18th, taking <coughs> our Gregorian calendar for those dates, but also July 18 lining up with the 26th day of the fourth month. So, so it was rather interesting um, what he noticed. But we know that the three days then, or these three camps, can we say that the three camps represent these three dates? Uh, maybe that I put that question that way. These three companies it could very well be right, and and we know that the the enemy here, the Midianites, represent uh, strife, which is that that division, that criticism that, that occurs. And we have three dates that were given us: November 9th, July eighteenth, and uh, December twenty fifth, twenty twenty one. Where, they, where we're giving a message about these dates. Now they're all part of a unit, right? This 300 symbol, but they're also broken into three companies. And so I think it's reasonable to say that these three companies represent these three dates that are used to then defeat this enemy. Now, specifically, how would they do that? How does November 9th, July 18th, and December 25th, 2021 defeat this enemy that Midian typifies? Defeat this message? So, so if we think back to, so we're going to go back before this, we're going to go to the message of Sisera. How was Sisera defeated? Because we spent some detail there. To How was Parminder's message defeated ultimately? How was it exposed? What tool was being used? So July 18th. Um, well, yeah, uh, attached to that was yeah, September, yeah, 7th, yeah. September 7th, September right. 7th, right? So, I mean, it is connected to July 18th, but specifically it was September 7th when Jeff got up and um, he, he awoke, he came out of hiding, and he presented the last message at Lambert Church. All right. Right, so he ties up the end of that movement. And Lambert is tied to that history, not just from Tess Lambert, but also uh, the role of Lambert Church in these prophetic structures. Uh, messages that were given at Lambert Church uh, have this uh, prophetic significance, um, which I've explained other places. I'm not going to go into details about that now, but... Um, so when Jeff presents the last message at Lambert Church, and he notes this later on, um, because he didn't know it was going to be the last sermon at Lambert Church. But they had to close Lambert Church and then ended up selling it. Um, it was actually Toby who owned it, if I remember correctly. So... Um, So when we look at what happened with the message of Sisera, that it was defeated by this understanding of chronology. Um, how, how is Midian defeated? What tool has God given us to defeat this enemy? Nobody wants to venture a guess. Well, 
Could you repeat that, please? Okay, so, so we have uh, Cicero defeated by chronology. I guess the question is, 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 are the Midianites defeated by chronology? And if so, how? What is the key that's given here for us to understand this? I mean, we've, we sort of touched on it already. Because Midian is defeated by We have all these symbols, so how is Midian defeated? Think of all the symbols of the 300 that we've looked at. Do people not know what I'm asking? Is Midian not being defeated by faith? Okay, but yeah, I mean, that's true, but I'm talking more in the symbols that are being used here. So they're defeated by 300 men, right? Who are divided into three camps. And we're saying that uh, the 300 represent... Um, there's a bunch of symbols attached there. Uh, the first mention of 300 is the 300 years um, that uh, Enoch live, lives after he begets Methuselah. So we, so we know that that 300 has these symbols of, of warning of coming judgment. Right? And so we've looked at that, but they're also divided into three camps. And we could say the three camps are these three dates, November 9th, July 18th, and December 25th, 2021. And they represent the three days, which is a call for repentance. And we also see that uh, this message produces um, not just a warning message, but it's also the light of the gospel is presented when human nature is put to death, when self is crucified. So that this is the gospel message that is going to defeat this message of Midian. So this is the message of revelation 14 that is defeating midian and the message of revelation 18 i'm not yeah setting it aside i'm just yeah. being very direct on yeah that. it's it's the three angels messages right right and so we can look at these as the three angels messages these three camps as well but, but we also understand that the three dates represent the three angels' messages. But it also means, then, that it is the study of prophecy with chronology that is defeating the Midianites. <clears throat> yes. But it's very specific in what this chronology is illustrating. Right. Right. So it's illustrating the everlasting gospel. We, we can say that November 9th represents the first day of the first month. Because cool. we have that symbol attached to it. Um, but it also represents midnight. Which, sure. which might seem contradictory, but that's because it depends what line you're looking at. Correct. Right. But also and, for, also yeah. for clarity if the first day of the first month is represented by November 9th, 
are we not also considering then that this would be as almost as a jubilee? Mm. Not sure how you're getting the jubilee in there. Well, on the 10th day of the seventh month of the jubilee year, they would announce the the fact that the the following year would be a time where they would not be planting, where they would be gleaning and living from the old, not of the new, right? Yeah, so they wouldn't plant after that time on a Jubilee year. So I'm just, I'm looking at this, combining the literal and the figurative, that if November 9th was to be a first day of the first month, that this would be something where we would have greater reliance upon God with no reliance upon man. Okay, so you're saying we're just gleaning. Correct. Okay. Well, and that could represent the time that this movement is in with November 9th. Exactly. Yeah. But we know July 18th, we also had as the midnight cry. And, and we know that the Sunday law was represented by December 25th, 2021. So those would be the three main way marks that Jeff had. Right. Um, now, the other thing that was pointed out is there's 300 men, but there's also uh, Gideon himself, which would be 300 plus one. Right. So in a sense, there's three plus one a three one combination there. But we have all of these symbols that, that we have looked at um, to show that this, this is referring to our time, but the enemy to be defeated, we have defined as uh, that enemy within, which is self, that critical spirit that has hindered this movement from coming together and working together, right? The, the movement is divided. And, you know, I've had some people be upset with me when I say that because their argument is, well, you just want the movement to be organized under you, which of course is the farthest thing from the truth. We just want to see the movement working together and not attacking one another. Because if the movement's attacking one another, aren't we like the Midianites? Exactly. So the Midianites end up attacking one another. So, so those that are not um, converted, that are not part of that message, the true message, they're going to be turning on each other. Now, we also know that this story of Gideon represents the Sunday law. And we know also at the end of the world, the wicked turn on each other. So this is something that happens by those that don't receive the message that reject light. But we don't want to be turning on each other. We want to be defeating the enemy. We want to be organized. And that's one thing we see in this story of Gideon is this organization. Not that we're asking for like a a structure like a denomination or anything like that, but the fact that we need to be able to work together, that we have the same goal, we see what the enemy is, and we work together. Now, I've always said that unity is an individual work. That means you can't just get people organized from the outside and think that that's organization. Each person has to be connected to Christ and be organized. Now, then we also dealt with... Um, the men of Israel gathering themselves out of Naphtali, out of Asher, and out of all Manasseh, and then also Ephraim, which we're going to deal with in the next chapter a bit more. Um, so Gideon sends messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim saying, come down against the Midianites and take before them the waters unto Beth Bara and Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Beth Bara and Jordan. Right. So, um, and, and this, when we looked at this before, um, the Beth Bara is, um, 
a reference to the fords, right? To where you cross the Jordan River. Right, the house of crossing. Yeah, the house, yeah, the house of crossing. So um, so Ephraim, its role is going to be um, to block the ford. And that's going to stop the Midianites from fleeing across back to Midian. That's the idea. Um, but, you know, some, of course, are going to get across. But uh, and then they're going to take two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb. And they slew Oreb upon the rock. Oreb and Zeb, they slew at the winepress of Zeb and pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of Jordan. So when we looked at Oreb and Zeb, uh, these referred to um, uh, specifically, if I remember, I don't, I always forget, I always get them mixed up. So the Oreb is the raven, the Zeb is the wolf. And they get uh, killed at the wine press of Zeb and upon the rock Oreb. So this is a spirit. The wolf, of course, we know a wolf can represent uh, an enemy and a raven. What was the idea of a raven? Uh, didn't we say he... Picking up after. Yeah, carrion. Carrion, yeah. 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 So, so we have this symbol of uh, a raven as well um, and, and a wolf. So we can see that uh, those who uh, pick at their brethren's faults and those that are really acting as an enemy, these are the ones that are destroyed. Okay, so, so we can see how these symbols apply to what's supposed to happen in this movement, which I believe will happen in this movement. Now, in chapter eight, we're going to have another pairing of names, and that's going to be Ziba and Zamuna. But it's going to be in connection with Ephraim, right? So let's, let's look at this. The men of Ephraim said unto him, Why hast thou served us thus, that thou called us not, when thou wentest to fight with the Midianites? And they did chide with him sharply. Now, of course, he's going to call the Ephraimites, right, at the end of chapter 7. But he doesn't call them initially, right? Is that the idea? I think that's what the presentation is. That he okay. does not call them initially. Yeah, he doesn't call them initially, but he does call them later. After, after they have the Midianites fleeing. But Ephraim is upset that they weren't called initially prior to this, where they're going to whittle them down to the 300. They're not part of that group. And he said unto them, what have I done now in comparison of you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? God hath delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb. And what was I able to do in comparison of you? Then their anger was abated toward him when he had said that. So we're going to see that Gideon gives this soft answer that turneth away wrath. Right? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so that we have with Ephraim. Now, what's the significance here then in this story? Because Ephraim represents uh, usually the Protestants, northern Israel. But what would it represent in this story relating to this movement at the present time or in the future? I was having to wonder if that wasn't representing some of those within the movement that 
or that are outside of these direct studies at this point that become upset because they were not brought in from the outset. Yeah, I, I would think that makes sense. Right, that there are people who, well, and they may not even really know what's going on. Right? Correct. Yeah. And and it could be people in the movement. I mean, a number of different sort of classes of people within the movement, people who've been in the movement, um, you know, prior to all this stuff that's happened, that have been in movement for a long time. And, no, and don't really know what's going on. Not everybody in the movement necessarily knows about our studies. Um, you know, people that have been in the movement and they may feel that somehow they weren't called. Um, but there could be even other people that, that do know about the studies to some degree, um, but have been warned from them or been biased against them. So there could be something there as well. So I'm not sure exactly who this represents. Don't you have like a hundred or a couple hundred people watching this on YouTube? Yeah, well, so I get up to about uh, 200 views on some of the videos. So that means there's people watching these videos. But I mean, I'm not sure how many people really still exist within the movement that still believe this message. Yeah. And it would be on various levels that people, you know, there are be people who probably still watch Jeff's presentations or uh, still study this message that we don't really hear about. So, so it may refer to some of these people, but it, but it might even, you know, refer closer to home people who actually know about, um, you know, they've been a part of July 18th and, and uh, they're dealing with the aftermath of it, but um, they don't feel that they've been directly called. I mean, I have a hundred, hundred and some emails that I send out, you know, a hundred and some email addresses that I send out to every week when I talk about the studies. So obviously not all those people are watching the studies. <clears throat> but it, it says that these people are going to defeat Oreb and Zeb, right? So this group that's classified as Ephraim, <coughs> it's gonna join in the message and defeat Oreb and Zeb. And Oreb and Zeb, if it's this critical spirit, uh, one of the reasons why many people aren't following the movement, I would think is because of the division they see in the movement because of how people have been treated, at least in their perception. And, and people have been treated badly. So we know we're not this movement that's all um, uh, united and speaking kind words about each other. This movement has had lots of conflict. So it could be that there is a class that um, has not joined in the movement because of what they have seen. But they will defeat Oreb and Zeb, the raven and the wolf. Now this message, because remember Gideon is not a representing a person or, or even specifically the movement, it's representing this message of July 18th. Um, but there are people attached to that message and so those people must have a character of Christ in order to give this soft answer that turneth away wrath if people are going to be attracted to this message um, it's going to be because there is a change in the people who are proclaiming a message now what about the Fords themselves I mean we, we're looking at Midian as representing um, this critical spirit that exists within the movement. And we have this, the Ford, which is the crossing of the Jordan, that, that is going to be, that Ephraim is going to be called to go to. So what would that represent?
The crossing of the Jordan represents what? Does it represent baptism? Yes. Okay. So, so Ephraim, if we're, if we're taking this correctly, is, is going to be um, a group that needs to hear the soft answer, right? It needs to see a change in the movement. And it's called to be at the crossing of the Jordan at the ford. And, and so it would represent um, baptism or a conversion that has occurred in this movement. And, and they also are going to experience that conversion. So there's, there's a work that's going on right now in this movement, a message in this movement that should be leading us to um, a renewal of our commitment to Christ, a renewal of our baptism. I don't think it is to some degree. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, the problem that we have is we don't really see ourselves as we should. We've created a false self that we present to others and that we try to convince ourselves that we are actually better than we are. Now, when Gideon came to the Jordan, it says he passed over, (coughs) he and the 300 men that were with him, faint yet pursuing. And we know this story because we've gone through it. He's going to go to the men of Succoth, and he's going to ask for loaves of bread. But, um, and, and they're pursuing, pursuing Zeba and Zamuna, the kings of the Midianites. But the princes of Succoth said, are the hands of Zeba and Zamuna now in thine hand, that we should give bread unto thine army? And Gideon said, therefore, when the Lord hath delivered Zeba and Zamuna into mine hand, Then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. And he went up thence unto Penuel Penuel, and spake unto them likewise. And the men of Penuel answered him as the men of Succoth had answered him. Right. So we had gone through this this story, which is. um, he, He spake also unto the men of Penuel, saying, when I come again in peace, I will break down this tower. Right, and Penuel is this place where um, uh, it means the face of God. So, I mean, we've looked at this story before, but now that we're looking at it again, and we're understanding this a little bit better, what do the men of Sukkoth and the men of Penuel uh, represent? Would this be those that have been within the movement that have opposed the message of July 18th? Okay. Well, one is they're not supporting Gideon. Right. Right. And Gideon is a message. Yeah. But these also must be messages. And, and the, the meanings of these words, Sukkoth, which means booths, I mean, we know that's, that's the Feast of Booths is called Sukkoth. Um, and then Penuel, um, that's going to be um, in Genesis chapter 
chapter 32, um, that's going to be Jacob, right? When he sees God face to face, that's after he had the, the wrestled with God. Okay, so, so here we have symbols which both would be positive symbols, right? Sukkoth booths representing the Feast of Tabernacles, Penuel, the face of God, um, you know, Jacob with the angel, the time of Jacob's trouble. So why are these symbols attached to those who do not support uh, the message of Gideon. Well, okay. Sukkoth is the seventh feast, right? Mm, I don't know. I, I've seen people count them differently, but let's say it is, yeah. We've, we have had other times as we have been going through this study, especially in the book of Judges, mm -hmm. where we've had to flip things differently. Uh, yeah, so a mirror image. Correct. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that these symbols are of a mirror image of those that think that they are understanding something when they're really not understanding something okay so because we have penuel means the face of god right let see god face to face and so we would look at that as being the moray vision the, the looking glass mirror right right because when you look into this glass you you in a sense you see christ in order to see yourself right we also are aware from from what Mrs. White had written, that those that do not follow Christ into the most holy remain outside the most holy, and the adversary comes up to them. Mm -hmm. So they believe that they are worshiping God in spirit and in truth, when in fact they're actually worshiping the adversary. Right. And so these would represent the way that these people see themselves, not the way that they really are. Correct. Because definitely they're acting uncharacteristic to the names of the cities that they're from. Now, um, now as far as messages, um, if we're going to take Penuel to represent a message, it would represent the message of righteousness by faith, seeing God face to face. And what would Sukkoth represent as a message? Would it represent the seven times? Would it represent um, some other? prophetic aspect I think the alternate aspect would be likely but I mean the seven times also remains especially if it was not fully understood would also be something to consider okay yeah so so we would have to say that these people i mean penuel and Sukkoth, should be representing in this movement those that are making a profession of these things but there are two specific cities here so there's two specific aspects of messages within this movement that are being illustrated here. And there's a tower that's been built in Penuel, 
right? That's going to be broken down. Correct. Okay. So so let's 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 come back to this. Now we know Ziba and Zamuna were in Karkor and their hosts with them, about 15,000 men. All of that were left of the hosts of the children of the east, and there fell 120,000 men that drew sword. And Gideon went up by the way of them that dwelt in tents in the east of Noba and Jogbaha, and smote the host, for the host was secure. And when Ziba and Zalmunna fled, he pursued after them and took the two kings of Midian and Ziba and Zalmunna and discomfited all the host. Right? So you're going to have this Ziba and Zalmunna. Ziba means sacrifice. Zalmunna means uh, shade has been denied. So that would be uh, Strong's dictionary giving these definitions here. So um, with Zalmunna, uh, it also means deprived of protection. So you got Ziba. Uh, um, Ziba means the, 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 uh, deprived of protection and Zalmunna also, it says here, means de de deprived of protection. So I'm not sure. It's sacrifice. So why it gives these two the same meaning, I find kind of odd. This is in Brown and Driver's Briggs. But properly, it means to slaughter. So I'm not sure if the one is wrong. Um, it's, So Ziba means uh, a sacrifice. And Zalmuna means deprived of protection. <clears throat> so how would we apply this before we come back to uh, Penuel and Sukkoth? So they're going to defeat these two kings of Midian. And what do they represent then? Sacrifice and deprived of protection. Any idea what's being illustrated? To not study, those that have chosen not to study according to Miller's rules that have, have chosen to study and been reliant upon the wisdom of man. Okay. So, so explain more. So we have Ziba, which means sacrifice. Okay. Do we not make a, a, a sacrifice when we are choosing to teach something that is not of God? Are we not sacrificing basically our own salvation to have greater reliance upon man rather than upon God? Yeah, so this isn't a godly sacrifice of an offering. This is us sacrificing our children, so to speak. It's a pagan sacrifice. Yeah. And then Zalmuna uh, deprived of protection or shade. <clears throat> when we are deprived of protection, it's because we have chosen to stand outside the law, that we have chosen that the law is of no consequence and that Christ is going to save us whether or not we have chosen the law as our guide. Okay. So when Gideon returns from this battle against Ziba and Zaluna, right? <clears throat> um, So they're going to capture Ziba and Zamuna, right? That's what's said here. And Gideon's going to return from the battle before the sun was up, so before the sunrise, <clears throat> and caught a young man, young man of the men of Sukkoth and inquired of him. And he described unto him the princes of Sukkoth and the elders thereof, even three score and 17 men. So that's going to be how many men? 77. 77 men. 
And he came unto the men of Sukkoth and said, Behold, Ziba and Zamuna, with whom you did upbraid me, saying, Are the hands of Ziba and Zamuna now in thine hand, that we should give bread unto thy men that are weary? And he took the elders of the city and thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them he taught the men of Sukkoth. And he beat down the power, tower of Penuel and slew the men of the city. And he said unto Ziba and Zalmunna, What manner of men were they whom ye slew at Tabor? And they answered, As thou art, so were they. Each one resembled the children of a king. And he said, They were my brethren, even the sons of my mother. As the Lord liveth, if he had saved them alive, I would not slay you. And he said unto Jether his firstborn, Up and slay them. But the youth drew not his sword, for he feared because he was yet a youth. And Ziba and Zomuna said, Rise thou and fall upon us. For as, as the man is, so is his strength. And Gideon rose and slew Ziba and Zomuna and took away the ornaments that were on their camels' necks. Right? So, so we have, we've gone through this before. We have all of these symbols. But now we're applying them, you know, more directly to... Uh, our movement and the men of Sukkoth are going to be taught and the tower of Penuel is going to be beaten down and Ziba and Zalmuna are going to be slain because they uh, did not uh, save them alive. The ones they didn't capture them, they killed them. So they're going to be slain. And then we have the firstborn of Gideon. Um, he's not going to slay Ziba and Zomuna because he fears he's too young. And Ziba and Zomuna asked to be slain by Gideon, which he does. And, uh, so where is this story pointing to? What is the message of July 18th Accomplish, accomplishing? Because this is about a message. Is it not accomplishing a separation? Okay. Um, well, definitely, I mean, uh, they're, they're killed, so they're going to be separated. But... Um, why do we have Jesus, the firstborn, this youth, uh, being fearful? He does not draw his sword. Who is this representing, or what is it? What is it representing? I'm dense today. I don't understand your question. Well, we got Jether, his firstborn. So Jether represents something. Um, his name means abundance. But he's not going to draw his sword to slay Ziba and Zalmuna. So Jether, while he has heard the message and he has observed the effects of the message, he is not willing to stand in defense of the message. Right. Now he's um, a youth, right? And his name means abundance. Right. Now, drawing the sword, the sword would usually refer to the word of God, but it would also to be uh, a part of the battle, right? So he's not really going to use what's been given to him uh, to further the cause. 
because he his name means abundance. So what would this represent? He's also the firstborn, so he's not the youngest of Gideon, he's the eldest. Would he represent the SDA? Well, it couldn't um, in the context of how we're interpreting this, because um, this would be about the movement. I mean, if we're making an application on a larger scale, we might we might be able to uh, make that application. Okay, the que uh, one question is, why is Gideon asking Jether to do this work? Why doesn't just Gideon go ahead and kill them himself? Why is he asking his firstborn, whose name means abundance, to slay Ziva and Zalmunna? At this point within the movement, are we not receiving great light? Is that great light not abundant? Okay, so we have an abundance of light. Now, we have a choice. Either we accept this abundance and walk according to that light, or we ignore the abundance and walk according to our own paths. Okay, so the message of Gideon is urging the people in this movement to take up their sword and defeat an enemy. And that sword would have to be the word of God. Right. Right. But, but there are some who fear because their youth, that is, they're inexperienced, right? Correct. Right. <clears throat> so there's all this light that this movement has, but if we don't take up that light, we're not going to defeat the enemy that needs to be defeated. Now, the other thing that's interesting here, so when we go back to Oreb and Zeb and Zeba and Zalmuna and Sukkoth and Penuel, we have all of these doublings, right? All right. But why is that? Is this not pointing out to us the importance that we must have upon a proper understanding of the first and second angel's message? Okay, so that could be part of it, could be representing the second angel's message. Well, as we've established, you can't have a third without a first and a second. Yeah. First angel's message also contains the elements of the second. Yeah. Now we know also... I mean, this to me would be a hint of where this we're making application of this line. 
So one of the things we've argued is that this movement is right now about the second angel's message. Right. Okay. Right. It's about the second angel's message because the first angel's message was done under the leadership of Jeff. It was given. And then we moved to the second angel's message with 9 11. Once we apply 9 11 as the arrival of the second angel. And we also compare this movement to Samuel Snow. And Samuel Snow is definitely the messenger of the second angel in, in Middle Age history. So we have these two, Zeban Zaluna, Peniel, and Sukkoth, Oreb and Zeb. They're paired together as a symbol of that. We see this same thing in the story of Joseph's, all the doublings, the two, the two dreams, um, two dreams of the butler and the baker, the two dreams of Pharaoh, uh, the 22 years, uh, the chiasms, the two periods of 11 years, the two periods of 17 years. Um, and then there's all kinds of stories, even in the story of Jacob of the doubling, right? The two periods of seven years, um, the twins, Jacob and Esau, uh, all kinds of doublings that occur. <clears throat> and I mean, this would represent uh, what we see in this movement at the present time. And, and also too can represent two classes. And we know we have negative uh, and also positive connotations to some of these, these names. <clears throat> I mean, Zeban and Zamuna could be sacrifice and, you know, um, uh, the other one being uh, deprived of protection, you know, and sacrifice in a good sense. But it, it does represent two classes and it does represent a message that's the second angel's message. Midnight in the Midnight Cry, which is where this movement is presently focused upon. Now, um, at the end of that, we're going to have these ornaments that were on their camel's necks. And these ornaments are a round pendant like the moon, a round tire like the moon, right? And so we can see that this is a symbol, the moon being a symbol of Islam. Um, and of course, the camels, uh, generally uh, an animal from the east. <clears throat> and the men of Israel said unto Gideon, rule thou over us both you and thy son and thy son's son also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. Now, here is where, you know, we have this new story, Gideon's ephod. And this is where we had problems before when we looked at this because we see this me message of July 18th, but now we see this ephod that Gideon's gonna make. So Gideon is a judge. It's a message that's given to this movement, but now we're gonna see this ephod that's gonna be constructed from all of these uh, earrings that are gonna be taken from uh, these men that are killed. It says they had golden earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And, um, and then the weight of the gold earrings we looked at before um, <clears throat> in, in detail. There's also the garments and the chains that were about the camel's necks. And Gideon's going to make this ephod. <clears throat> and this ephod is going to become a thing of worship later on. So if we take this story and we try to put it on our lines, um, in some ways, it doesn't make sense. We have Gideon, this message of July 18th, and all this conversion that occurs, the defeat of the Midianites. And then we see this story, which is a pretty negative story. Um, and we, we know that this is going to be a 40-year period that they have peace. But there is also this stumbling block, this ephod that's going to have a part to play. So how would we take this story now of 
this making of this ephod, how would we apply it? Is, is there anything wrong with him making this ephod? Let's, let's ask that question first. Would the ephod be something where the people are looking for direction? Okay. So, so the people are looking for direction. So July 18th comes and goes. Nothing happened. December 25th, 2021 comes and goes. Um, and what, what is the movement looking to? Where is it seeking direction? Well, here's this is an ephod that is not constructed by the instruction of God. It's it's constructed in keeping with that instruction, but the real ephod is yet within the temple. Right. Yeah. And this ephod, I mean, it looks like it's pretty heavy. So it would it would be something that we could say would be a burden to wear. Well, is it even possible to wear it? That would even make it more of a burden. Yeah. OK. Now. <clears throat> So there's lots we don't really know about this ephod. We know what the Bible has told us and uh, spirit of prophecy. But this ephod is something that's constructed um, with these, the spoils. So, so when I look at this and I look at... Um, a man may hierarchy a false priesthood, Angela says, the ephod could represent. But we have a good message, the message of Gideon, the message of July 18th. And, and Gideon has an attitude that he's not going to rule over them. But there's going to be this request, and this is to have all of this gold, which is going to be constructed into an ephod. Now, we know that all Israel went, went, went thither, a whoring after it, which thing became a snare unto Gideon and to his house. Now, if this, if this ephod weighs, um, is made out of all these gold earrings, 1,700 shekels of gold, I mean, how much gold is that? How much would this weigh? I mean, I know we looked at this before. I think we started to look at it. I don't remember looking at it in detail. Well, I know I did. Um, so, so this is, well, it's not too heavy. Here he says about 50 pounds, 1,700 shekels, about 50 pounds. Who says? Um, this is at uh, Kiel and Dillich. So they're just converting this shekels into pounds. Um, but some people have quite a bit more. Okay, so um, we got John Gill, he says, 810 ounces, five drachms, one scruple, and 10 grains of the weight of physicians, but is reckoned dealing with this amount um, 6,800 crowns of gold. It amounted to 3,500 Hungarian pieces of gold. 
um, and of their money at Zurich, upwards of 15,413 pounds, and of our money, 2,380 pounds. Of course, that's not weight, that's value. But um, so I know we looked at this before, I can't remember all the details. Um, you know, they, they're going to give estimates of money, but these are out of dates out of date values, uh, the weight, et cetera, 1700. So this is the Cambridge Bible, uh, 1700 shekels of gold by the heavy standard, nearly 75 pounds. Um, single ring might weigh half a shekel. So, so anyway, this is something I guess they could wear. It, it'd be a pretty heavy ephod if they used all of the gold here. So 1,700 shekels of gold beside the ornaments and collars and purple raiment that was on the kings of the Midian, kings of Midian and beside the chains that were about the camel's neck. So he's going to make an ephod of this. Now, could we take this as some kind of construction of chronology? Is there a construction of chronology in this movement that we could say is a snare? That people are pouring after. If we are applying events of the world without firmly establishing it from scripture, yes. Okay. Because we know we have um, chronology that's being used in the movement still from June 18th um, that I believe is correct as far as the chronology is concerned. The problem is the interpretation of it. And that goes especially when we are dealing with these things that we twist a little bit of this chronology in an emotional manner. Yeah. So, so one of the things I look at first, and, and I'm not trying to say anything bad about uh, Dan uh, Vanderhorst, but you know he kept setting dates, and and he's kind of disappeared. And I don't know if he disappeared because of discouragement that nothing happened on the dates he expected. But, but I warned him that, you know, we couldn't predict events. Just because we have some dates, they may be part of a structure, but we shouldn't be seeking something with those dates. Now, now I still have dates that are future. I mean, we got November 24th, Thanksgiving coming up. But we're not expecting anything. I mean, something may happen on some of these dates. We don't know. Um, but there's a different approach. We also see what... And, and again, I'm not trying to be hard on Odilio or Colin as far as I think that the chronology that they're recognizing is correct. But we need to put these things in the proper perspective of what God has been showing us. <clears throat> and God has not been showing us that um, we can make predictions, which in a sense, I still see that people are trying to look for vindication. <clears throat> that if something happens on one of these dates or, or something happens that we can predict, 
then somehow people will listen to us. And I think that's a mistake. Uh, it was a mistake with July 18th as well, because even if people were going to come to us because Nashville occurred, I don't think it would make any difference. It's caused more disappointment. Well, <clears throat> but even if it happened, it would, people would have come to us, true, but the work that God wants to do wouldn't be accomplished because we wouldn't be able to handle it. Um, and people wouldn't really be truly converted. God is working in a specific way to cause us to see our need of him so that we can be truly converted. And here, what you see is man with an ephod putting himself as a priest, right? Because that's why you would wear the ephod to serve in a temple that's not God's temple in Jerusalem with a false priesthood. So can we see that the message of Gideon could be used incorrectly? And it's going to use this spoil, this gold, to construct it. But that this is not of God. So when we're constructing this chronology, what we are doing, <clears throat> I still think that it's... It's different in purpose than what I saw with Odilio or Collins' chronological constructions, which I think were correct constructions. But it's a different purpose. Can we see that? I mean, the primary purpose of the chronological constructions that I see is to show that God has been leading us and that we're still moving through prophecy. We're still a part of these lines, which are typical lines. But if we're going to take chronology and try to predict the Sunday law, what are we doing? Are we not doing the same thing as Parminder did in 2012? that Jeff called fanaticism. <clears throat> Any thoughts on that? I'm having to consider it. Okay. <clears throat> I mean, what we see right now is we have predictions regarding Trump and regarding the Sunday law, not necessarily an exact date. Uh, ideas about the pandemic, how they lead to the Sunday law. And there's, there's all kinds of problems with their interpretation of the data. We know the chronology is correct, <clears throat> but there's nothing that attaches to that chronology, the events that they're looking for, because we understand that these dates are symbolic or typical, and they're part of our line and that our line is typical, that we should not expect the Sunday law to happen anytime soon in the sense of, you know, 2022 or 2023, because we have a work that has to be accomplished first. Can we see the Sunday law 
if the Levites aren't warned? No. No. So to be talking of a Sunday law happening immediately when the movement hasn't done anything to warn anyone, to me, is wrong. Can we see the wheat growing when we haven't planted it? Well, you definitely can't go out to harvest if you haven't done anything to plant. You're well, not going to get much of a harvest. No, the analogy is, can you see the wheat growing when you haven't planted it? No, you can't see it growing. But they want to have a harvest, right? I mean, we're, we're, looking, we're looking to go out and harvest a crop a bountiful crop, and we haven't done anything. We haven't broke, broken the soil. We haven't planted any seeds. We haven't weeded and watered. And yet we expect that there's a harvest. They have placed the cart well before the horse. Yeah. And so this movement, you know, professes to believe something and yet isn't acting in a way that it believes it. We're not working towards the goal that we profess to believe in. We're not working towards the Sunday law. We're not doing anything to get ourselves ready, really. And we're definitely not doing anything to warn others so that they can be ready. So to me, this ephod must represent this. But the ephod is constructed by Gideon by this message of July 18. And, and we're going to see that Midian, the Midianites, which represent this, are going to be defeated, but that there are still going to be people who are dependent upon time setting. Let's, let's just call it that. <clears throat> now, when we have the death of Gideon, um, this would be the end of this message of July 18th and its specific details. So he's going to have three score and 10 sons. So that's 70 sons. Um, and then there's going to be a concubine that was in Shechem that also bare him a son whose name was called Abimelech. And Gideon, the son of Josh, died in, the, in a good old age, was buried in the sepulcher of Josh's father in Oprah of the Abba Ezrites. And it came to pass as soon as Gideon was dead that the children of Israel turned again and went to whoring after Balaam and made Baal Bereth, that is, uh, Bereth means covenant, Baal means Lord, Lord of the covenant, their God. And the children of Israel remembered not the Lord, their God, who had delivered them out of the hands of all their enemies on every side. Neither showed they kindness to the house of Jeroboam, which is Gideon, according to all the goodness which he had showed unto Israel. So and we're taking this as a message. Now, when we're, when we're putting this on a line, of course, um, we know that there's going to be this message of Abimelech that's going to result as a illegitimate son of Gideon. And, and of course, we've looked at this before. Now, the death of Gideon... <clears throat> Uh, we know that there's this message of Gideon defeating the, the, um, the enemies, but the death of Gideon itself, what does it represent? Would the death of Gideon interrelate with the retirement of Elder Jeff? Okay. <clears throat> now we know, of course, the defeating of this um, enemy of the, of the Midianites is, is still continuing. 
But we could say that we can go back and look at this as a repeat and enlarge. Right? Agreed. And, and I think we sort of have to do that. So I would look at the death of Gideon having to do with the end of the July 18, 2020 prediction. And, and the fact that it didn't occur. Right? So what we predicted did not occur. Jeff is, says that's the end of FFA. July 18 was the, gonna be the end of FFA come what may, whether it occurred or not, he was gonna retire. So, so we have the death of Gideon. It's the death of a message. But Gideon had three score and 10 sons, 70 sons. Right? So what does the three score and 10 sons represent? Seventy, what does it represent? You said 70? 70, yep. Yeah. Three score is 60 plus 10. So 70 close sons. Of, well, it could represent close of probation. It can represent a close of probation. It can also represent the seven times. Yeah. Okay. So there is a message that comes from Gideon that's connected to chronology, to the seven times, to, to the 2520, and all these different things. Um, but there's also going to be this other son, Abimelech. And he's, from a, he's born from a concubine that's in Shechem. And what was the significance of Shechem? Remember, Shechem is between Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. Right. Okay. So that's the blessings and the curses. Is that Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so out of this, this message of the 2520, uh, we have this Abimelech. Okay, so, I mean, that's going to be the next chapter, dealing with Abimelech's conspiracy. Right? And there's going to be a bunch of symbols there. But if we're going to take this, this story right now, the main thing that we want to see is that we have this message of July 18th. It produces some offspring the 70 sons and this other son. And we need to figure out what these, what these are representing and how we would put these upon a line. Now, remember, as we've moved through this, we've had the enemies that were left in the land. And then we have, it becomes closer to home as we move through this story. The enemies move from external to internal, even though they're all kind of internal enemies, but represented by external forces. But now we're going to have Gideon's own son becoming the, the enemy. I mean, in a sense, I mean, if we look at Abimelech, he's seeking to take on the role of a judge, Right. He wants, to, he wants to rule. And so we need to recognize what he represents. So it's, it's quite a long story. We've gone through it before. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, time is up basically. So we're, we're going to come look at this. And we're, again, we're going to have to be able to put this on a line. I think we're going to have to draw some of this out tomorrow. Yeah, okay.
Yeah, so that we can see it a bit better. Um, so before we close, I'm just gonna go over to uh, a drawing that I did here. So I just wanna address something. Now, when it comes to these, these dates, time setting, so what you're gonna see here is a more chronological witness of aspects of this message. Now, the first one, what you see here is from November 9th, 1989 to April 5th, 2030. So it may not be very big on depending what device you're watching this on. Um, but one of the things I had done is we had looked at this date, November 24th, 2020. So this is a Thanksgiving day uh, date. It's, it's, it's connected to the Thanksgiving prediction of 2018, which was to be a witness that we could not predict events. So there's no way in which I'm taking November 24th, 2020 as a prediction of an event. Now we noticed though some symbols with it. It's 11, 11 days after November 9th, 2019. 11, 11 represents uh, the 11 generations and the 11 generations, the 11 years, the 11 years, um, which adds up of course to 22 generations, 22 years. It's the story of Joseph with the 11 years. Uh, we also have Daniel 1111 and other 1111s. And so that this connects to November 9th, 2019 is quite interesting. Now, I can also go back from November 24th, 2020. Um, and we can do that to time setting on June 9th, 2018. And that's 1629 days. That's a symbol from Odilia. And if we go back to July 18th, it's 859 days, which is 1533 days in base eight. Well, it's not 1533 days, but it's 500 and 859 days. If we take that number 815, 859, instead of putting it in base 10, we put it into base eight, we get that symbol of 1533. We also have um, in here, you're going to see that. Ukrainian War, February 24th, 2022. It's 273 days to November 24th, 2022. And also back, it's 586 days to July 18. Um, but the new information that I have is if you go from November 24th, 2022, and you go back 1190 days. So for instance, from when Stephen was born to September 11th, 2001 is a 1190 days. 1190 days is um, 32 and a half years. More specifically, it's 390 Gregorian months or 403 Islamic months or lunar months. Um, it's the time in which Ramadan comes around again to the same date. So 1190 days or 11,900 days is a symbol of the message of Islam. And if we go back there, we come to April 26, 1990. It's also notable, April 26 is the 26th day of the fourth month, a symbol of 264. But November 24th is 11 times 24. It's taking November as 11, 24. And you multiply it, you also get 264. And so we have these witnesses of this structure of a date that we have in the future that we have no event tied to it. We don't know what it means other than being Thanksgiving. Uh, we also notice from November 9th, 1989 to April 26th is 186, 168 days, 168 hours occur in a week. So 168 is a symbol of a week. The other thing that's interesting is if we go from April 26, 1990, and we take the number of days that the manna fell, specifically from the day that first day the manna fell to the day that they go out to seek the manna and there is no manna. That's a period of 40 years, biblical years, less one biblical month, which is depends on how it's counted, but 14,587 or 14,588 days. The number of days to April 5th, 2030 
is 14,588 exclusive days. It's 40 years less a month on the biblical calendar. And the number of days from November 24th, 2022 to April 5th, 2030 is 26,088 days exclusively and exclusive count. And that's 16 times 168. So we have this witness of a date in the future. Am I building an ephod by doing this? Or am I doing something else? Now, the declaration of December 6, 2020, they would say, I'm time setting. Right. I'm just, I'm just throwing out dates in the future. And one of these days, one of these dates, something's going to happen. And it's not going to be meaningful because I have all these different dates. But like with the chart like this, you're recognizing waymarks. Mm -hmm. Are we not to recognize the waymarks so that we can say, see where we are on the road? Mm -hmm. That's the way that I look at it, is we, we don't know what these dates mean in the future, but we're not, we're not setting our hope on any date. We're not trying to predict some event so that we can be vindicated. But we are seeing that there is a structure that exists. In some ways, we are building an ephod, but it's not meant to be a stumbling block. And, and I don't know if that's the best way of looking at it, but it is what results from the message of July 18th. I think I'd have to challenge you on that one. Okay. Now, we're coming to a point, though, if we're going to challenge something like that, I think we're going to have to address it tomorrow. Yeah. So I want, I want to address this tomorrow because I want to address, because I'm looking at this story of, 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 Gideon with the ephod and also, you know, the rise of Abimelech. And I want to understand it correctly. And I want to make sure that we're not doing something that we're not supposed to be doing. Right. I'm not saying this is building an ephod. What I'm saying is it could be perceived as that. Right. Right. That is, it could become a stumbling block if it's not understood correctly. Does that make sense? That's a good recovery. Yeah. Well, that's the way that I think of it. I'm, I'm worried. Maybe worried isn't the right word, but I'm concerned every time I see a date in the future that it's going to be misused or misunderstood. Because I understand what these are for. But I don't want to build an ephod. I don't want to do something that is going to be a stumbling block and it easily could become, right? So we need to understand this correctly, what God is showing us by this. Right. Because I don't think this is happenstance and it's definitely not created by my mind. It's just things we notice. <clears throat> okay, so uh, let's close with prayer and we'll come back to this tomorrow. Dear Father in heaven, we ask again uh, for your care and protection. We're so thankful uh, for the light that has come to us. But we ask that we can discern it correctly, that we cannot be misled um, by what we see in front of us, but that we can see clearly what you, why you are giving us this light. We pray that you can... Do your work upon our hearts through thy spirit. And that all of these studies will be to your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.